Welcome everyone. Welcome to Psyched. It's a, a show where we talk about psychological experiments and psychology um, and some of its application in the workplace. Joining me is Andrew Chu. Andrew, welcome again uh, to our show. And today we've got, uh, you know, we, we, we've been we've been inundated with a whole <laughs> bunch of discussions. I mean, last year, last week was like like forensics. <laughs> Technology. I mean, I never even heard of uh, of the term. And, <laughs> and trying to understand if your employees are criminals and and trying to recruit non narcissistic folks. I mean, that was just really engaging. Um, and today, I think it's even more interesting, right? Because it's about monkeys, right? We're going to go uh, dive into the world of monkeys, and we're going to talk about Harlow's experiment, warmth and relationships. So, you want to uh, tee up the the topic a little bit, and uh, we've got a fabulous guest, right, that's going to be joining us. I yes. think one of the best psychologists uh, in Asia, if I'm not, or maybe the world, right? Uh, but but we'll, we'll have him in a bit. Uh, but tell us what we're going to talk about, Andrea. Cool. All right. Welcome, everybody. Uh, for those tuning in, you know, drop your comments, drop your ideas. Have you heard of Harlow's experiment before? So Harlow, let me give you a bit of context of who Harlow is. So in the 1950s, he was very famous for um, doing research with primates, so monkeys, and then he did a lot of cognition, learning sort of uh, research. But then he found something interesting. And that's when he dived into this experiment about, you know, whether warmth, affection, love was not just the only thing people need versus what they need like food and you know all these survival uh, needs of a primate or a monkey and of course primates as you know are the closest species to us human beings and therefore it is pretty much saying that we are also like that okay so we are going to show you a very quick video of the experiment itself have a watch Newborn rhesus monkeys will grow up not in accordance with nature, but in the controlled atmosphere of a laboratory, where all the psychological influences of childhood can be duplicated. In a classic continuing study, infant monkeys are removed from the mother at birth and raised in semi-isolation. Other individuals can be seen and heard, but there is no physical contact, no interaction. Food or security, which is motherhood's stronger appeal? Alongside a warm, familiar mother of cloth is a stark wire doll set up as nothing more than a feeding machine. The young monkey is placed deliberately on a cloth mother which has no milk to nourish him, but fulfills some fundamental needs. This experiment revolves around one simple question. Will the infant monkey switch his affection to a wire mother which offers food and life itself? Only when forced by hunger does he loosen his grip and begin to yield to nature's most powerful internal drive. From the wire mother, he derives one thing, nourishment. No warmth, no comfort, no feeling of security. After feeding, he returns to spend up to 22 hours a day near the only mother he knows. From this inanimate object, the infant derives all the security and mother love he needs. He can, if also exposed early to other young, grow into a normal, well-adjusted adult. All right, and we're back. I think, Roshan, you are muted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. No, uh, and, you know, I, I, I find it interesting. I mean, I guess, the you know, this kind of a synopsis of, of the experiment, but what was interesting is that, um, you know, when when they were left without a mother, even a surrogate mother, right, many of them, you know, uh, sort of, even when they were given food later on, they, they decided to not eat the food, right? I mean, ultimately, many of them died uh, just by not getting warmed. And I, I you know, there, there's further research that I found very, very interesting. Um, one of the research is from Yale's um, scientific journal, the uh, uh, Yale University Science Journal. And one, you know, one one they showed psychologists um, that that people just you just held a warm cup of coffee. Uh, they felt a lot more generous, a lot more caring. I mean, just just a warm cup of coffee, you know. And then there was another study, I think, that that talked about how people are likely to give something to others if we just have something warm, uh, and and they and 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 rather than having something cold. Um, so I know next time if I need to get you to do something, <laughs> you know, you some, something really warm, right? Uh, but but there, there's there's a lot of um, I guess thoughts. 
um, that that these things are, are, are inculcated. And, and and there's a further study I think in in 2010 where uh, Duke University Medical School found that babies uh, with very affectionate and attentive mothers just grew up to be much more happier, resilient, and less anxious adults. Um, so so tell you know uh, um, I mean your thoughts, Andrea. You know as you as you as you uh, as you dive through some of these uh, research and as you look at this Hallows experiment. I think it's very interesting because a lot of people would say like, as long as the kid survives, it's enough, right? It's always enough. But truth is not enough. There are other needs besides the, the normal survival and stuff like that. And research always shows uh, that children who receive affection, like for example, from their parents or even as adult figures or people in their surroundings, for example, in foster homes, if they are close to each other, they have affection, they have a lot of love, they are going to grow up as happier and more successful adults, more, uh, as they call it, physio psychologically well, you know, they are able to adapt to a lot of changes. So, I mean, it's also interesting how warmth, right, something that we feel with our senses can also be linked to affection and love, right? So, a lot of things, like a lot of research in the last few decades, like maybe 20, 30 years ago, hugs, right? They research whether hugs actually give a lot of affection. And one of the funny uh, stats that I remember is that a woman re needs to receive at least 12 hugs to uh, a day to survive the day. So I'm like, who do I get my hugs from if, if we're wow. all working from home? <laughs> <laughs> <We're so hard. laughs> yeah. And, and, and that's, that's the coolest part, right? So we see that from childhood, if they receive this kind of environment, then they will be better, well-adjusted uh, adults. But we have a guest uh, with us who will give more of uh, the expertise compared to me and Roshan. And uh, maybe Roshan, you'd like to introduce him. Sure, sure. And, and in today's exciting, right? I mean, we've got uh, Dr. Go Chi Leong who will be joining us. And, and uh, Dr. Go is uh, probably one of the most uh, preeminent, um, I mean, he's so well known uh, across the psychology world. Uh, today, he's CEO of a number of schools, right? The real schools, the Street KDU, and, and a number of others. And they are very, they are growing uh, entity. And um, Dr. Go, welcome, welcome to our show. And uh, super glad to have you with us. Um, you know, we, we were talking about Harlow's experiment. Um, warmth. I, I think there's a the, the the other element is on psychological safety, right? Uh, because I think I think a lot of it, even the office, like we realize that safe psychologically safe workplace tends to bring out a lot more uh, of the best of an individual, or, or enable them to grow. Um, and and you know as as we maybe we start this dialogue for yourself. I mean your your own childhood and or, or as you uh, observe many parents and, and children, and I'm sure in your own work that you encounter, especially in schools, uh, different kinds of students, um, is there a correlation between hugs, love, affection uh, to, to psychological safety to better adults uh, as some of them grow up uh, into adults? Sure. Thanks, Roshan and Andrea, for inviting me to be part of this. You're right. I, I think it's a really interesting conversation. I think Harlow along with actually quite a few other researchers of that era. I mean, you know, people like Bobby and the rest were really looking at something called attachment, right? You know, so all of these, uh, a lot of the research you've cited comes as part of, you know, attachment, the area of attachment. And the fact that, you know, uh, what they were arguing at that time was that uh, that first bond that the child uh, uh, connects with in terms of their caregivers, so whether it's the mother or the father or the uh, parents or the primary caregivers, that in some way that determines the way that they relate to others when they grow up to be adults right so they talked about things like attachment patterns but i think look the main takeaway from harlow's experiment and, and others like it is the fact that you know um that human beings beyond just basic physical needs you know like food and like milk and like shelter and like oxygen that that exists you know uh, a greater spectrum of needs that include emotional needs, the need to be recognized, the need to be held, you know, and this interaction within, in a sense, your species, uh, you know, or maybe even be between species, because I mean, a lot of human beings, you know, they may not get their hugs from other human beings, they get their hugs from their puppy dogs or their cats or their, you know, animals. But I mean, this interaction with, I guess, another living being, right, that includes physical touch, so whether it's shaking hands, a pat on the back, a hug, you know, eye contact, you know, all of these, I guess, form part of, you know, our, our emotional makeup, you know. And, and so I think uh, let's start with that first, that as human beings, regardless of 
whatever environment, so whether it's the work environment, whether it's the home environment, there's this need for recognition beyond just the transactional life. So it's not just give me what I need, food, water, money, you know, oxygen kind of thing. But beyond that, there is something that that is uh, that that is emotional, that is deeper, and those needs need to be met, you know. And I think that's what Harlow's, you know, that's the main takeaway point. So whether it's parents, you know, needing to hug their child, kiss their child, hold their child, you know, express that kind of affection so that bond and the connection is there, you know, beyond just, you know, you're helping me survive, you know. And then so whether you call it love, warmth, affection, these things are, are a, a basic human need. You know? And I think that's what these experiments are showing. And in and, and this time of pandemic, right, especially with younger working adults, right, who've just, you know, kind of left their home and, you know, uh, Andrea's an example, right, you know, uh, by herself, uh, the nice little bit at the back there, uh, working from home. How, 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 I mean, how does that translate, right? Um, when, when we are all not, a, you know, with social distancing and not allowed to, I mean, there, there, there can be pets. I mean, what if you don't uh, have that, that opportunity? I mean, how, how do you, how do you substitute it? What, what, what do you, how do you get it? Right? Because you said, like you said, it's a need, right? It's not a want, right? No, I mean, and you're right. I, I think that's one been one of the most difficult things about the lockdown pandemic is the fact that we are all separated. And, and a lot of uh, people, young and old, are actually unfortunately isolated. Like, you know, they're not with their family. Maybe the family is outstationed or overseas or somewhere else and, and or their friends, you know. And so the usual Friday night, you know, hugs where hey, let's all go out together and we are, you know, just that recognition, you know, just a handshake, you know. Uh, that's missing. And, and I think a lot of people have suffered because of that. I think all of us actually to some extent. But look, you're right, Roshan. I mean, look, physical contact is not the only means of recognition. And, and I think that's what we're talking about. Like, you know, it, it's, it's not the physical contact itself that is going to be magical because, I mean, look, in a sense, we can hug pillows, like, but that's not the same, is it? You know, so so if you want to simulate just a physical sensation, I mean, you can put a hot water bottle under your pillow and hug it the whole night, you know. But I, I don't think that's the same as, as that human recognition or recognition by another living being. So I would say the substitute, whether it's family, whether it's friends, whether it's office workers, uh, to, you know, that pat on the back or that handshake or that hug is other forms of recognition, you know. So, so it's other forms of interaction, you know, other ways of communicating the fact that, hey, look, we love you, we care about you, you know, uh, and, 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 and you matter, you know, and, and we want to recognize you. So I know it's not the same, you know, I mean, all of us miss hugs, you know, I think we're all looking forward to that. But, but I think there are other ways of, in a sense, communicating that same warmth. And, and really, we're talking about connection, right? I, I mean, what Harlo is talking about is it, it's a connection. So, I mean, fine, we can all go hug our pillows and all that. But I mean, what we are really missing is that human connection. And that's why I think in a lot of offices and work cultures now, we talk about the fact that, you know, aside from just, you know, let's get straight to the agenda and let's, you know, uh, talk about the business is that more and more. Uh, committees and office settings are now setting aside time at the beginning, at the end of the meeting to so say, let, let, let's, let's, let's just have a chat. Let's put the work away for a while. How's everybody, you know, just to simulate that kind of very natural interaction and recognition that takes place in the office when we are, you know, in the water cooler, having coffee together, passing each other on the corridor and we're talking about the movie we watched or whatever it is. So I think all of these kind of points of informal interaction you know, are, are in a sense symbolic or reflections of human beings saying, look, you know, it, it's, I, I don't just treat you like a number or a KPI, you know, it, it's it's about, look, you know, I, I see Roshan and Andrea as human beings and, and we interact like human beings. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, and, and you know, it, it begs the question, I guess, uh, you know, as we start looking, especially for parents, right? I mean, uh, and if you are a parent, and you, you are a parent, I think, uh, uh, of, of a teenager or kind of slightly older now, I think. Uh, but, but you know, especially when they go into this teenage phase where they don't want um, that intimacy, <laughs> they don't want that... <laughs> They don't want the parental uh, uh, sort of love and care and, and touch, right? Um, and and uh, I mean, parents struggle with this, right? How, how do we want, express our love and our care and our warmth? Um, at the same time, there is kind of a pushback 
um, you know, from, from the teenager, but they need it, right? I mean, ultimately, especially now in this lockdown era, right? I mean, previously you can go out and hang out with friends. I remember both of us used to hang out a lot, uh, you know, where, where we used to do all stuff with our parents, right? Uh, but we got enough uh, hanging sure. out and touching um, that we didn't really need our parents at that point in time, right? Um, but but how, how do kids these days, and, and, and then with the advent of technology, right? Um, stuck in this technology, um, how's that affecting us and, 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 and what, 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 I mean, you know, fast forward five, six years, what's going to happen to some of these children, right? Um, uh, kind of, you know, pushing back on this, which is natural, but also not having the, the friendships and the other pieces, uh, life, uh, because of the environment that we're in today. And, and, and here, I think that's an interesting point. And this is where I think is the best time to also bring in the fact that, look, people are not homogeneous. Like, not everybody is the same. Some people are very, very, very huggy, uh, you know, everywhere. <laughs> so whether in the office, at home, you know, I mean, some teenagers are still very, very huggy, you know, and they, they seek that tactile affection. Not everybody is like that, you know. I mean, some kids, even from a young age, sort of, you know, they are not comfortable with that interaction. So I think we also need to recognize, like anything, there are different personalities, like, you know. But like I say, at the heart of what we're talking about is the fact that we're talking about recognition and warmth. And, and to, you know, to show recognition and warmth, to show that, look, I love you, I care about you, I'm here for you. I mean, there's no one way, right, you know. So I think, I think it's not so much about the fact that every staff, every child, everybody needs to be treated the same way because their needs are different. So I think we see that, you know, even in attachment styles, by the way, I mean, so Bobby and all that, that experiments that show different people are different. So some people, you're right, Roshan, I mean, a lot of teenagers, of course, you know, they go from, you know, I want to be hugged by mom and dad every night to, yuck, you know, get away from me, you don't, don't touch me kind of thing. But look, I mean, it doesn't mean that they don't love their parents or they, there's no connection. It's just that they're connecting in different ways. Like then we do other things together. We have movie nights, we have sharing meals together. We are, you know, playing Roblox, you know, virtually and, cyberspace together or Dota or whatever it is. And all of these are still forms of connection, right? So again, I think let's not lose sight of the fact that what they're talking about is, is connection, like emotional connection, recognition, and there are different ways to do that. So I think you're right. If if parents here are listening and going, yeah, my, my kid doesn't want to be hugged, not the end of the world, you know, it doesn't mean that there's no connection there. It's just that then we have to find other channels, other ways of expressing that affection in a way that is comfortable for everybody. But look, I would say at a young age, typically it's quite common that at, that at a young age, you know, everybody, I mean, most young children want that physical contact. So, I mean, very few babies, you know, uh, you know, like in the experiment, uh, don't seek the mother or the father's, you know, or the caregiver's touch. But like I say, as they grow up, they hit 12, 13, 14, that changes and that's quite normal. So I think even as adults, Roshan, you know, I mean, we are talking about the workplace and applying the same principle to the workplace. I mean, you're right. The, the, the bigger picture is how do I create a workplace where the different personalities in my office are each finding, uh, you know, the recognition or the affection that they're looking for in different ways, you know. So it's not about everybody is treated the same, like I say. So it's not about, okay, let's hug everybody in the office. That's the office culture. That's going to freak out a lot of the staff, you know, who are not the huggy, you know, touch type. And, and they go, whoa, whoa, you know, this is, not the, this is not a safe office, you know. So I think the way to create a safe space is to say, hey, we accept differences. And we realize that different people want to connect in a different way. But we have ways to connect with you here. And, and we want to be connected with you here and in different ways. And like I say, even earlier when I talked about, you know, that informal chat and hey, let's talk about movies, let's talk about your family. I mean, even then, there are some office workers that also are not comfortable with that, you know. And so, again, I think a safe place is to say, hey, look, we're not forcing everybody to share your deep, darkest secrets. This is not therapy, you know. So, so we're not saying, OK, look, everybody around the table right now, you know, share some personal problem you're having because some people are not comfortable with that. So, again, I think, you know, uh, leaders in the office need to have that balance like, and start off with the fact that, okay, look, all of my staff are a bit different. All of them are comfortable with different things. They've come from different backgrounds. That's fine. You know, here in the office, we create an environment where we, 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 we emphasize connection, healthy relationships to one another. You know, that the main overarching message is we care about you. We treat you like human beings. But how you interact with each other, we create that space so that you can do it differently. And so it's so, not, you know, one size fits all kind of thing. You know? So, so it's really enabling the infrastructure uh, for recognition and and affection and connections to happen now, uh, right? Is there is there is there too much 
um, you know, some, sometimes some employees like, hey, it's too much recognition or too much uh, um, uh, connection and, and, um, and it has adverse effects, right? Um, is there, especially in a workplace, right? Um, I mean, that, that's one piece. I think the other piece, the other, the other piece is for bigger companies, right? How do you do that, right? Um, to make everyone feel that they are getting the recognition, the affection and the connections um, when there's so many of them. Um, and they all crave it from usually a couple of people, right? Not not that many, right? So how how do, how do you manage it in the workplace, right? Because um, well, it I is mean, there, are, there are two parts, Stella. So I think the the first part, you know, of the question is the fact that I I think you know it, it's there's a difference between connection and affection being offered, you know, and made made accessible, and it being imposed and fostered, you know. And, and so I think you can do one by saying, hey, look, I mean, my door is open. Let's talk. If you want to talk, if you want to chat, if you want to get some coffee, you know, if you need a hug, cup, all right, you know. But that's different from saying, okay, I'm forcing everybody to share. I'm forcing everybody to be hugged. I'm forcing everybody to be, you know, in a sense, open and, and with your private life, which like I say, I mean, just law of averages, uh, you know, I mean, 20, 30% of staff are not going to be into that. You know, because to them, they are more private people. They are going to be more introverted. They are going to be more, you know, th this is not for me. You know, this is not, you know, I, 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 this is not, you know, like I say, this is not the same as my family. And I think that brings me to the second point, which is I think employers still need to say, okay, look, our job is to look after staff, create a safe environment where staff feel safe. They feel motivated. They feel comfortable with the kind of healthy relationships you have. But look, the office is not meant to take over the role of the family, right? You know? You know, and, and, and that's different, you know, so meaning meaning I, I, I'm, I'm still not going to take over the role of I'm not your parent la, or your wife or your husband or your, you know, and that's not appropriate, la, you know, I mean, so, so of course we care about each other and that's fine. But, but, you know, there's a fine line that we don't cross, isn't it? And I don't think any company in the world, you know, I mean, an it's not reasonable for an employee to say, look, I'm joining this company and I'm expecting this to be my whole social life. Eh? So this company is going to be my family, my friends, my boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, I mean, my children. I mean, no company in the world can meet that need. And in fact, it becomes very, I would say, a bit unhealthy yeah, because then your, your whole life evolves around the company. When we say, I mean, you need a balance, you know, that, that you need, not all of your needs can be met by the company. Yeah? I mean, this is not, you know, uh, George Orwell's 1984 where, you know, I mean, the, the government or company can take over your whole life and, you know, big brother is watching you all the time. So, I mean, nobody wants that. So, I think there's also a balance to say, hey, look, you know, I mean, the company is, is not going to, you know, look after you 24-7. Like, you know, there are going to be certain needs you have that you need to find outside of this organization. And that's completely normal and healthy. And, and so, I think, you know, the, 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 the leaders or the HR department heads who are watching this, you also need to give yourself some space and slack, like, you know. You're not meant to, you know, like I say, look after the staff 24-7 for every need that they have. I mean, that's not reasonable. And I would say that's not healthy. You know, staff need to have a world and a life outside of the company as well. And, and that's why, you know, I'm always a bit wary of, you know, when some companies try to do everything and we've got everything, you know, everything is here and free food 24-7 and, you know, you've got this and that and even places you can sleep and all that. And it's always like, you know, I'm sending the message, you know, th this is, you, you live here, like, you know, you don't go home. You know, and, and I think, I think, so we need a balance to say, hey, look, you know, in the end of the day, the organization's role is to, you know, create an environment where you feel happy, you feel connected to your colleagues, and they are, we, we open this invitation to say, look, if you, if there are emotional needs and psychological needs that you want us to, to meet, then these are some of the, the these are the, some of the channels that we open up, All right? So whether it, it's, you know, I, and I'm always encouraging employee, uh, you know, employee assistant programs, free counseling services. So just like most companies offer free clinics, right? You know, we pay for your medical needs. We should also pay for psychological needs. Do you want to see a counselor? There's somebody here, you know, and like I said earlier, we also try to keep our interactions and recognitions, you know, spontaneous and, and it's not just work, but, but we also recognize you as human beings. If you need help, if you need some time off, if you're having a difficult time, then we rally around you, like, you know. I mean, that's a company, that's a safe yeah. company yeah. culture, right? But yeah. that, that's different from, like I say, I take over your whole life, like, you know, and, and I, you know, every need you you have, we've got to meet it. So I think uh, there's a balance there, like Roshan and Andrew, you know, I mean, uh, a line that a company doesn't yeah. cross because then it becomes, like I say, a family, a religious group, yeah. and, and yeah. That, that's yeah. different. Yeah. You know? 
yeah, yeah, yeah. No, and and you know, uh, uh, you know, I, and if anybody has any questions, you know, shoot them in. You know, I I've been neglecting our audience. We have a whole bunch of people who joined in. We have uh, uh, Jayashri, welcome. Uh, we have uh, Saira, welcome. Uh, and I think you three things. We have Anil from Singapore who's joined us. Anil, welcome. And Anil also makes a comment. He says, "Love, love the philosophy of being a balanced work environment." Um, and and uh, and and also Sashi, and and we've got a very interesting question from. Uh, uh, Matthew, who says, uh, "What about my aunties at family reunions that keep hugging me all the time? Why do they do that? Why do they do that, <laughs> uh, Dr. Go? Why why do they do that?" <laughs> so some people are very tactile, like I said, different personalities. So some people are very huggy people, and and you know sometimes you have to remind them, "Hey, look, you know, not everybody is like you." But you know, I mean, I, I think we can give some aunties a bit of slack, lah. You know, I mean, I, I think uh, I'll be worried if the bosses are forcing, you know, hugs on every every employee. You know, that's probably a lawsuit <laughs> waiting to happen. You know, so yeah, I, yeah, that's that's uh, another question that are you... different from bosses, lah. You know, right? Okay. So, so for those who are joining us, you know, we're talking about the uh, Halos experiment with monkeys, and and one of the things uh, uh, in in his uh, uh, experiment, for those who who missed it, is that he basically uh, took a couple of monkeys and and put them with surrogate mothers. Uh, uh, one with uh, with wire with food and the other one with like a, a, a sort of a surrogate mother and uh, there's a number of interesting findings that came out uh, from his uh, experiment and I think one of the biggest finding uh, Andrea you want to summarize uh, in in 30 seconds uh, what his biggest findings were cool so his biggest findings were that all these survival needs like food and stuff like that is not the only thing uh a primate or a monkey wants and similar to humans right we want affection we need affection sorry let me stand corrected we need that affection and love that warmth and uh, these monkeys stayed much more longer time with uh, the surrogate mother who had like this furry um, piece of cloth on her versus a mother who was full of wires and just giving milk yeah so that is the findings that we got and uh, we we're talking about attachment and how this relates to our adult relationships as well um yeah Yep. So, so we got, uh, you know, Anil made a comment. Let's not forget it's finally a workplace and not make it a home. Um, although, although, you know, um, and, and, and Dr. Go, I mean, that, that'd be the interesting thing to talk about. You know, many offices are becoming more like homes, uh, you know, with, with, with Google and stuff where they, they try to personalize it. Um, is there is there a boundary? I mean, I understand that conceptually we don't replace a family, uh, but the, the, the lines are becoming very blurred, right? Um, what, what is your take on that? I mean, to, to me, what I said earlier like, is the fact that, look, not, nothing wrong. I mean, you want to make the office more hip, more <laughs> Gen Z, new millennials, you know, let's have beanbags. So nothing wrong. I mean, that that's, I, I, I encourage companies to be more contemporary, you know. And so I think, I, I think the idea here, though, is it needs to be clear, like, you know. I mean, the workplace is still a workplace that is designed to create a safe, welcoming, inspiring, motivating environment where the focus and the goal is for staff to come in and be able to optimize their talents and skills to be able to perform the best in the company right i mean that, that's still the goal you know and and so all of these things whether i offer you know healthy food better lighting all of this is perfectly fine but i think there's a line between that and saying that you know i'm trying to create a place where i, I want you to be here for until 3 4 a.m every night and not have a life outside of it and and your whole world evolves around it and and i think that that's where i think the line is drawn like that's okay completely all right to be healthy to be hip to make it cool but but i think you know offices and companies need to check their motives line say okay look what are we doing here you know it's one thing saying okay all of this is to help them make it happier and productive and another thing that is, I think, more incendiary, like, you know, that, that I think some organizations, to be honest, really are almost creating a Venus flytrap kind of environment where, you know, then staff are, are there, like, you know, and, and they've got no life outside of the organization because they are there until 2, 3 a.m. every night because, you know, we give them everything there. And, you know, it, 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 and, and, and I think that that's unhealthy. So as speaking as a psychologist, we say that's unhealthy. Because then, you know, how do I then leave my company if my company becomes everything to me? There's no transition, you know, yeah, yeah, and there's yeah. no time and space for me also to develop a life outside of my work, which I think, look, you ask any psychologist, whether it's an organizational psychologist or a counselor or a clinical psychologist, they say, that's not healthy. Like, you know, you need a more balanced life where, you know, you, you need interactions, relationships, people, time, hobbies that are not all just 
in one place, right? I mean, you don't put all eggs in one basket. So I, I would say that's probably where you draw the line between, you know, being a good, healthy work environment that is fine, that's cool, that's comfortable, and, and that's great, you know? To, to yep. being an environment where, like I say, you're sucking people in to this very unhealthy lifestyle where their whole life is the company. And, and we don't want that. Yep. And, and you know, we, we're going to take a quick short break for about 30, 40 seconds. Um, we're going to check out Budaya or Happily. Uh, it's a, it's an awesome app. In fact, you know, when we talk about recognition in the workplace, right, when we talk about providing affection, providing a tool for your employees to connect with each other, especially in these pandemic times, um, here's a great little tool that you can leverage. So we'll take a quick break and we'll be back here. There's many questions rolling in. Keep your questions coming. Uh, we'll be back here with Dr. Go Chi Leong. Uh, and Andrew Chu in sight in a minute. See you in a minute. Welcome back to Psyched, and uh, we've got a bunch of people who've been joining us. I think, uh, um, and 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 Dr. Go Chilong is here with us, our resident expert, psychologist, and CEO uh, of uh, a, a huge educational institute uh, with, with real schools and strict edu. Um, Dr. Nora Mena from uh, Maybank, uh, she totally agrees with you, Chilong. I'm not sure which part, but uh, something said resonated. <laughs> uh, and and we've got a question. We've got a couple of questions actually, but let me get to uh, Ridi from India. Uh, she asked this more than environment. Does having great careers make us feel more attached to the organization? AKA, do we consider career growth as being nurtured? Yeah, and, and I think, look, uh, I think Roshan, Andrea, I know Leaderonomics does a lot of work in this area when you look at worker engagement, right? You know, so w whether I choose to stay with the organization, do I feel inspired and motivated? Look, I mean, the workplace, you know, I mean, the environment, the lights, the, the setup is probably 5%, you know? I mean, the major part of it is more, do I feel that this is the right place for me to grow as an individual? You know, I mean, uh, uh, the culture in this organization, do I do I align with it, the values, you know, and as we know, we talk about immediate leaders, like oftentimes I, I stay or leave based on who are my immediate supervisors. Do I enjoy working with these people, you know? And so when you add in all of those, I mean, I remember we talk about six, seven components of worker engagement. I think all of that applies to that. Now, one of it, of course, could be environment, but you're right, we, we shouldn't overstate that, like, you know? I mean, things like free food and, you know, the perks and all of that are not the most important things in the end. I think most people now are intelligent and they are, they are savvy enough to realize that it's about matching my own career and growth needs with the organization and, and are we moving in the same direction together. Yeah. And and you know we've got we've got a couple more questions uh, popping up. Uh, another one from Ridi. Uh, she says also our uh, new age schools and colleges doing this unhealthy bit, which is making kids have fun at school but missing out on the <laughs> being disciplined and driving excellence in sports and studies. And uh, Tiger Mom here, I think. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a balance, like, I mean, okay, don't, don't even talk about schools. Parents is the same, one, right? We we talk about one of the most you know. Uh, the, the most healthy forms of parenting we say are authoritative parents. And that's, you know, a balance of, look, I mean, authoritative parents still have boundaries, they're firm, they still set high benchmarks, they still challenge their children, they don't get, you know, let their kids get away with being lazy or being small brats, you know. But on the other hand, the affection is still there, you know. The meaning the children know that their parents love them, that open communication is still there. So I would say, same thing with school, same thing for office environments. So schools also need that balance where we say, look, we care about you. This is a safe place. We're not going to bully you. You know, teachers are not 
here to humiliate you, make you cry every day. I mean, you know, when we talk about bullying in the school, sometimes the teachers are the biggest bullies. So I think, you know, certainly in our schools, we've said all of that is not acceptable. We need to have a safe environment, but a safe environment doesn't mean that we don't challenge our children. In fact, the irony is this, and this is where, okay, we go back to people like Bobby and the rest. Uh, Bobby was, I think, one of the mentors for Halo, right? And one of the things they found was, was interesting was this. When the child is securely attached to the parents, the child was more adventurous and willing to actually experiment more. All right, so that you know, when when a child is securely attached, as long as the mother is there, the child will be, you know, the, the the baby will be willing to crawl further out, go and touch things, hold things, you know. When when the child is not securely attached, that's where the child doesn't dare to explore. So we say, in a school environment, if you create a safe place where the children know that they are safe, but they are being challenged, the child is actually more willing to be challenged. You know, the child is more willing to be actually going out there stretching out of the comfort zone you know so i think i think those two things are may sound like a paradox but they come together so that that's my comment to you know that question yeah, which yeah. is that yeah, yeah. when you create a safe emotionally engaging environment you can actually you know push and and the child is actually more adventurous and willing to learn and and you know one of the the things that we have done is we've put together this framework called the science of building leaders and and when we talk about secure bases right and this psychological safety right partly is parents and coaches and so on at the early formative stages uh, is so very important um, and exactly like you said but but the same thing translates to the workplace you know um, when you go into the work your first job your first boss the relationship you have. Um, all these are uh, huge triggers um, that are that are pretty important, and, and, and it's drafted in our our science of building leaders. Huh? You know, we've got we've got other other comments. I, I think uh, Reedy says she agrees. She's a she's a tough she's a tiger mom, uh, and 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 she likes this whole tough love um, uh, uh, piece. And and uh, Dato Nora saying hi, uh, welcome Dato Nora. But let me. I mean, I I mean, I, I think you know, seeing Dato Nora's name there kind of triggers. You know, in the workplace, is that the same? Um, do we also need to practice that tough love as managers and leaders in terms of having that psychological safety net of comfort and, and affection and connection, but also being able to push and dare and enable them to, to take risk and, and go further and stretch themselves? How is that done? No, I mean, I, I, like I say to me, you know, when you think about the human brain and and, and what motivates us what enables us to you know stretch ourselves so whether it's learning whether it's even in the office environment huh? we're always stretching stuff you know i mean the 70 20 10 principle where you know i mean we're getting stuff to go out of their comfort zone stretch themselves expand you know growth mindset right i mean what what psychology teaches us is when people feel secure and safe when they feel not under threat huh? that's when it liberates their mind to be willing to expand themselves that way so whether it's a young child in a school whether it's an adult in a work environment it's the opposite when i feel threatened all the time meaning okay look you know i, I make a mistake you know the bosses are jumping on me in a in a, an unsafe work environment where i feel no connection i don't trust anybody i don't trust my boss i feel threatened i feel always victimized in that environment then is there a growth mindset no of course not in that environment then my job is just to okay get through the day without getting fired i'm not going to stretch myself i'm not going to take any initiative i'm not going to learn anything unless you put a gun to my head and so i think i think that that's how it plays out la roshan you know the fact that in order to actually encourage this kind of growth mentality whether as a parent or a boss as a, or as a teacher the the it sounds like an oxymoron huh? but i mean it's a it's not a paradox it's the fact that you create this emotionally safe environment then then that's where they, they they are more likely to actually stretch themselves whereas when the child is always under threat and fear i mean the child will will do things but certainly not by their own initiative and when you're not there anymore as a parent or when the teacher is not there when the boss is yeah. not there then the child doesn't Stop. care you know yeah yeah yeah, yeah. No, that's true. And, and you know, we've got a good conversation going on between uh, Dr. Nora and Rudy. And, 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 and I think uh, she's saying, you know, the, the, the term tough love may not be the most uh, appropriate. Uh, you know, not, not uh, definitely not, not free M&Ms and the like. It's the authentic intent of enabling one to contribute to the best of one's ability because of aligned outcome and genuine care. And I think there's, there's a point, there's a good point there uh, about alignment, right? Because that's some well, that's one of the big derailers when there's confusion and there's misalignment. Um, and she also makes another point to say, tough love is not a term I use. I prefer to use the term growth 
and I think Reedy, uh, you know, counters are saying, yep, growth is a word uh, that is more outcome oriented, and I'm going to use that now. Um, so, 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 you know, uh, good conversation. I think some some food for us to think. Um, I'm going to close out and ask the audience, you know, how would you like to receive that human connection in your workplace? What are some ideas that you have? You know, assuming that physical touch, the hugs, the handshakes um, may not be so available. Um, what, you know, recognition are, are these words of affirmation or, or, or uh, apps like Happily that enable you to recognize uh, people? But what, what are some best practices that you know in your workplace um, that enables connections, recognition, and what we call uh, affirmation or uh, affection uh, to enable, you know, put it, put them down in your, in the comments below. Um, and yeah, I, I know I, I've been, I've been hugging this conversation. Uh, I need to give you some, some time. So there's has a ton of questions. So Andrea, uh, shoot away and I will mum myself out from now on. <laughs> all right. Thanks, Roshan. Yes. Uh, yeah, I've been listening to all your insights, Dr. Go. I think they're excellent. I think there are two questions I will ask, one from a parenting perspective and the other one for a workplace perspective. So the first question I have for you is, how do parents know or gauge what kind of personality their child is, right? Because, you know, if you look back like maybe 50 years ago, our parents say, my job is to feed you, <laughs> put a roof above your head, give you clothes, and then send you off into the adult world. Um, and then over the maybe 20 years ago, that's when parenting changed. A lot of uh, encouragement, a lot of support, a lot of secure bases and stuff like that. Um, but, you know, as, as young parents or even older parents right now, they have many children or even one kid. How do they know, okay, this is the time for me to, uh, in other words, give a bit more of discipline versus this is a time for me to support them and encourage them instead of giving punishments. How, how, what are some of the advice you would give parents in that stage? I mean, that's a tough question, Andrea, because I mean, I, I think we, we call this situational parenting or leadership, like, you know. Mm -hmm. There's no one rule, unfortunately. There's nothing, no, you know, one, two rules, a simple formula that I can give that is going to, you know, help parents make decisions every day because I think that's the challenge of parenting and that's the challenge of leadership, which is we have to use our judgment like every minute of every day. Uh, mm -hmm. Like you say, to decide and discern based on this situation, based on the child, based on their emotional state, based on the context, you know, what do I do? Is this the time where I need to be firm? Is this the time I need to enforce? I need to, you know, discipline? Or is this the time where the child needs help? Or do I do both? You know, and 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 again, I, I would say, um, you know, oftentimes with parenting, you know, uh, the time to discipline and to sometimes, uh, you know, reinforce boundaries is the same time where we also actually reinforce our love and yeah. our affection for the child and these two things you know go hand in hand so we send the child the message that look we love you and and this is important we hold the child but we also say look in this situation we also need to hold you accountable for the consequences of your actions you know mm -hmm. and, and so let's work together so again it's not about i love you today because you're a good boy and tomorrow i don't love you anymore because you know you're a naughty boy i mean the love is unconditional and constant yeah. But, you know, that also means that because we love you, there are times where that there needs to be firmness and discipline and boundaries. And, and just because we love you doesn't mean that you can do whatever you want in this house. You know, I mean, part <laughs> of your growth means that there are boundaries that we need to reinforce. But look, like I say, it's difficult. Right? So, I mean, unfortunately, yeah. there's no magic yeah. solution that I can just give now and say, okay, follow these two rules. And then as parents, you know what to do. I mean, all of us who are parents realize it's incredibly complex, like leadership. And same yes, thing as leaders yes. in an organization. It, it's, it, it's, you know, th that's why it's difficult. Like, it's situation by situation. It's case by case that we need to then use our judgment and all of the knowledge and wisdom and expertise we have at that moment to say, what do I do with this employee at this time? Yeah. You know, yeah. so, so I, unfortunately, I, I, I can't offer an easy solution because I don't think there are easy solutions. I, I think it is a complex situation and... You know, I mean, the, the, the only advice I can give us is at that point, you know, use all of the, the knowledge and the wisdom that you can. And, and, and then you, you try your best to make what you think is the right decision. Hmm. I think there, there are two comments I'd like to add on here. I think one is that, you know, some of the research shows that um, the new parenting that came about is when you are 
explain to your child what they have done wrong, you still remain some kind of physical contact. So I've seen them a lot um, in, my, in my own family, you know, my nieces and my, my brother and all that. They do that. Um, they hug her while, while uh, they tell her what's wrong and what are some of the things that will happen when she does this. And I found that very amazing to, to witness and to see that it really works uh, with kids. I think the other part to it also is the reason why I, I enjoy marketing, parenting and leadership is that it's always a constant experimentation. It's always yep. a test and try. Um, but the key word I want to bring here is actually something called repair. Um, you know, I, I just want to tell parents out here who are also struggling or even leaders and managers who are young or are struggling there is something called repair, right? If you failed or if you made mistakes and you felt like it didn't work for somebody, whether it's a kid or a, a colleague or a, super, a supervisor or even somebody, a subordinate that you are watching over, there's something called repairing that relationship. I think that's very important. And it comes down to what you were mentioning just now, right? The core of it all is this human connection that we crave and need. And that comes to my second question. Um, if you if you are in an organization, let's say let's say for employees, right? If you're an organization that forces certain things on you, for example, you have to attend uh, team building exercises, uh, you have to send in you know uh, affirmations to your colleagues and all these kind of things, and you don't feel comfortable about it. How do you bring this conversation forth with the people involved, especially HR or your managers? What is your advice on people who are in that situation? Well, I think, Andrea, the, the answer is in the question. I think you bring it forth. <laughs> it's as simple as what you've just shared, which is basically you, you tell them, you share, you know. And, and look, I, I, I think you can do it in a very respectful way that is non-threatening and say, look, I, I completely understand why we're taking some of these initiatives. We're trying to build a culture. We're trying to build a value system. I appreciate that. But I just want to share as part of this openness that we want to encourage that there are a couple of things that I, I'm just a little bit uncomfortable with. And there's nothing wrong with that, you know, and, and I just want to give you that feedback. You know, I'm not against the values of the culture of the organization, but maybe, you know, these one or two things, right? You know, these are things that I'm just feeling a little bit uncomfortable with. And I think nothing wrong with that. So especially with organizations that are trying to develop a very open culture and, and that's what you want then like i say i think this is important uh, because if not you know the, the the issue is sometimes we can make the mistake of reinforcing or, or forcing or, you know sort of uh, pushing down the throat of mm -hmm. our employees uh you know certain practices or certain habits that may not be really essential to the running of this organization and and may not be comfortable for all personalities right yeah, and, and I think the key key thing we I would like to share also is the fact that people need to listen, right? As um, people who are in charge of making sure people have that safe environment is to listen. Um, that's that's actually quite tough. I, I realize with a lot of corporate companies, it's very hard for them to listen to what um, their employees need. It's like school, right? Um, our teachers will say, I know what's the best for you and this is what it is, now do it. Uh, versus, okay, I hear you, let's work it out. Um, and, and that's it. And, and we have Roshan coming back as we close this episode. Uh, once again, yeah. thank you so much, Dr. Go. Yeah. And, and you know, I want to I wanna, I wanna close with just maybe pieces of advice that you can give to, to three groups of people. Uh, the first is parents. Uh, I mean, what sort of advice would you give them, um, you know, in terms of ensuring there is affection, connection and recognition in the in the family. Uh, I think the second person is the leader in an organization or leaders in organizations uh, or anyone that is a team lead uh, that has people reporting to them. Uh, how do you build those three things, uh, the affection, connection and and, 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 and connectivity and uh, uh, sorry, the last one is recognition. Um, and, and the last one is for an employee. Right? Um, how do you help ensure that your organization builds the right sort of uh, environment? How can you contribute uh, and be part of playing a part in, in terms of enabling this to, to to enable your organization to be a lot more fluid in terms of uh, building this sort of a culture and, 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 and name? So if you can if you can sort of give this three pieces, yeah. quick, quick piece of advice to these three groups of people, um, we, we can wrap this up. Uh, and, and again, you know, thank you so much for your time. No, it, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks, Roshan and Andrew. I mean, I would make it even simple. I, I've got the same advice for the three groups. And basically is on top of what we've already sh shared today, eh, I would add to say, take time to understand the perspective of other people. And that's the key. 
So whether it's the perspective of the child, if you are the parent, and take time to put yourself in the position of your children. And, and then you're in a much better position to then say, okay, what do they need? What are they seeking? How do they want to be engaged? Same thing with bosses or lead um, uh, employers who are thinking about their staff. So just take time before you do anything. Just take time to put yourself in the positions of your employees. And same thing with employees. Like, you know, and so you, you look at your colleagues, your bosses, your other team members. So I think that kind of empathy or empathetic understanding, that's probably missing. Like, you know, when, when we want to try to do a lot of things and a lot of initiatives, but, you know, the fundamentals is that we need to understand the people that we are trying to care for. And, and so that would be my advice. Yep, yep. And, and you know, I, I, I gave that advice once to someone in my office and said, put yourself in someone else's shoes. Um, and she literally went and wore somebody else's shoes and says, this doesn't really fit. You know? So, but, but I, I, you know, essentially, I understand what you're saying is, is uh, make sure we, we, we take that time to have that empathy uh, and, and, and be able to connect with, with what other people are. You know, some great articles on leeromics.com. So if you go to leeromics.com, um, professor from INSEAD, uh, Manfred, Professor Manfred, he writes about connection between love and work. Uh, great article of South African, uh, Caroline writes, um, how to uh, leadership and love. Um, and I think there is a great podcast uh, from Liramix FM. If you go to Spotify, just type Liramix FM, you'll be able to see Home. Uh, it's a podcast on parenting where, uh, and I think Dr. Go is featured in some of those podcasts, Raising Young Leaders. Uh, you can check that out also on Liramix.com. So uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Go. Really appreciate your time. Um, and for those of you looking to check out Happily, you can go to budaya.app and you can check that app. Um, so thanks again, Andrea, your final 10 seconds of uh, closure and, and uh, your final, final, final thought. Um, okay. Maybe you uh, can, you can <laughs> to know what's coming up, what's coming up uh, in uh, in uh, next week. Cool. All right. Uh, so next week we have a special goal, uh, special guest, Rachel. Qu I can't even pronounce her name properly, but Quas, I think. Child and family development specialist. You know, she'll discuss how working parents can actually take care of their kids' mental health as they go to school from home. I think it's an excellent topic. Um, my final thoughts on this topic is I think the key thing that boss uh, Roshan and my parents have in common is they will tell me actions have consequences go and learn and fail fast and come back. But always remember you can come back. So I think that's a, a very excellent quote that my parents always tell me. Um, and I think that's something that I want to partake to also the parents and leaders here that let them go and explore, tell them there are consequences to what you do, but always have a place for them to come back to. I think that's very key. So thank you so much, everybody, for watching uh, in, in, and tuning in again. Thank you so much, Dr. Go. Uh, it's been a pleasure to have you on board as well. Thanks, 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 Yudong, and uh, have a great, great week, everyone. And remember, keep your environment and keep the culture in your office uh, psychological safe, safe. You know, uh, uh, connect, enable connections and uh, uh, affection, and ultimately uh, recognize. Uh, thanks for that, that great advice. And we will see you guys next week, same time, same place. Uh, here's Psych signing out for now. <laughs>